Hello, and welcome to Skeptics and Seekers. Uh, I'm one of your hosts, uh, Dale, representing the Christian or Seeker side. And I'm David, the Skeptic or Rational side. <laughs> um, so, as you guys, as you guys, um, just a quick announcement. So, you guys were probably expecting Shroud Wars round two because um, uh, me and Alan had originally set it up for today. Um, there has uh, we have had to postpone that. So, according to the plan, it's supposed to be for next week. Um, so what's going to happen this week is me and David are going to continue our Messianic Prophecies series. Um, and this week it's going to be on one of the most famous ones, Isaiah 53. Um, this this prophecy has probably been responsible for you know converting um, many people, many Jews to the Christian faith over the years. Uh, it's, it's definitely the most famous and in the minds of most Christians, it's, it's the most conclusive uh, Messianic prophecy that, that exists. Um, so, yeah, just to sort of lay out my minimal case of what's what's going on here. So this is, uh, in the larger context, it's a fourth servant song um, that's part of, that, as I said, four servant songs. Uh, and the full context starts from Isaiah chapter 40 uh, all the way up to um, Isaiah chapter, the end of Isaiah chapter 53. But I would also say read chapter 54 for a bit of context as well. Well, um, this this is relatively um, basically it speaks in the context of the Babylonian exile. So it starts in the beginning speaking about the nation of Israel uh, going into exile uh, and then being restored, um, and a whole bunch of good things are going to come about as a result of that. However, as we progress. Uh, the text begins to narrow in on a certain individual who represents the, su the suffering servant, who represents the nation of Israel and fulfills it because Israel is not good enough. Uh, they they are spoken of as the blind servant. Uh, they're not uh, you know a light to the Gentiles. They're not living up to their uh, expectations. That um, is in the overall context of the prophecy when it's talking about. Isaiah. Um, so I was thinking David was bringing up last week that some people interpret this about the nation of Israel. Um, and many Jew modern day Jews try to say this as well. Um, but I don't think this makes sense um, because it's clear that it's not the nation of Israel. It, it's it's the nation of Israel is the blind servant. It doesn't live up to its repu uh, reputation in this regard. So it's a narrowing down um, and I'll, to what I think is an individual. And I'll let David uh, say what he's going to say about that. Um, but yeah, what what is this? Okay. Um, and many Jews say this is a messianic prophecy, but in terms of the national uh, interpretation, bear in mind, this interpretation didn't exist until the 11th century. No authoritative Jewish source up until uh, Rashi in the 11th century interpreted this to refer to the nation of Israel. Not in the Talmud, not in the Aramaic Targums, not in the Midrash. Um, it just it doesn't exist. So um, there is actually an, ex an exception to that. Uh, it's not from an authoritative Jewish source, but a Christian origin uh, who says some learned Jews were saying this. Um, but yeah, it, it's not in any authoritative source until Rashi in the 11th century. That kind of says something. Um, and it, it's clearly in the context about a, a mess, what the Messiah would do. So what would happen? Here, here's what I want to get out of this. So in terms of what he would do, he would be led like a lamb to the slaughter. He would die for the iniquities of us all, including the Jews. Um, and he would be make his grave with the wicked and yet be buried with the rich. But here's an added layer. He would also rise from the dead. He would have his, he would have his days prolonged and see his progeny, which is probably going to be something David's going to say. Well, that doesn't apply to Jesus. I, I bet. Um, but um, yeah, so amazing that this is saying that the Messiah would die for the sins um, of ev of everyone and then rise from the dead. Who does that sound like? That definitely sounds to me like it's talking about Jesus. Um, 
So yeah, I think in a, in a nutshell, keeping it keeping it short. Um, this is yeah, that that's my take. I'll turn it over to David. This will be a short one probably. Okay. And, and bear in mind, folks, just me and David had to prepare this in like lightning speed because I was prepared to do the shroud debate. So like I I had to research and prepare our blogs in like you know in the space of one day. So if me and David aren't on our best game, that's that's why. Okay, so uh, as uh, Dale said, it's in a nutshell, and um, I think that's pretty apt um, because some of it's a little bit nutty. Uh, so, what is what is the nuttiest part of this uh, for me? So, so Dale wants to cite historical precedents of what the Jews thought. I think this is a mistake because historically the Jews didn't think that it meant Jesus. So if, if you want to cite historical precedent about what the Jews thought, you don't get to Jesus. Uh, if you look at what the Jews thought during Jesus' day in the writing of the Gospels, they also didn't seem to think it meant Jesus. Jesus' own disciples who had walked with him and lived with him and snored with him and belched with him, uh, when Jesus says, hey, I'm going to die, they didn't say, oh, wait a minute, Messianic prophecy. This is the guy. They said, oh, no, you're not. <laughs> so, um, you know, they they obviously weren't thinking this way uh, either. So... You know, I I just I don't I don't think that citing Jewish um, historical precedent of what they thought about this passage really points you to Jesus. I would uh, also say that if you read the passage, there are a number of problematic elements in it uh, that don't seem to point to Jesus. And I would just I'm just going to make a general statement I can't prove it but I think that most Christians banging on about Isaiah 53 have never read Isaiah 53 I just I think it it's one of these that they they've heard of it they've heard citations from it I don't think they've ever read it and so I suggest you take your translation of choice and sit down and take the three or four minutes it takes to read it because it's not a very long uh, chapter what are we talking about 11 verses 12 verses uh, 12 uh, but it, it's also it so this song starts in 52 verse 13 to the end of 53 so don't, don't just sure that's that's fine but I mean you can read uh, chapter 52 through 54 and still not take that much uh, more time. These are not long chapters. Yeah. And uh, one thing, though, I, I would say just to back up, David, um, if, if you do have time, read the whole... Con start in Isaiah 40 and then read the full thing. Um, that's what I did when I studied it um, all the way up to 54 because then you'll see sort of the, the flow of what I'm talking about, how, how I get there. So, yeah. Sorry, David. Go ahead. Yeah. So, I... Uh, Last week, uh, my blog post was, let the Jews speak for the Jews. This week, my post is, let Isaiah speak for Isaiah. And uh, I cite various passages uh, from Isaiah, uh, you know, because Isaiah reads a little bit differently when you let Christians speak for Isaiah. And so... Uh, very interesting. I just before I start citing Isaiah, I just want to cite something from Dale's blog post this week. He may want to uh, moderate it a bit, but I just want to read one paragraph from it. it says now this verse obviously means uh, to speak of Jesus, uh, and he says there is no question about the existence of um, such an unfalsified claim. And he goes on and he talks about uh, how skeptics are trying to undermine the clear and obvious meaning of this text. Um, you know, there, there are a couple of things I find a, a little bit offensive here. One, he used, you know, his whole post is scattered with language like that about how clear and obvious it is. And I uh, mention in my blog post, this is spoken like a person who does not know literature, <laughs> let alone Jewish literature, and has very little experience um, in, in dealing with that academically anyway. Uh, so I don't, I don't want to suggest that I'm an academic, but I'm enough of an academic to know how, how difficult and challenging 
uh, literature can be. Uh, we can't even say that things are obvious in literature that's written today by authors we know. Uh, and then when you knock it back a few hundred years, you've got to go to school for four years to just get in the debate uh, about what the literature meant. And then you knock it back a few thousand years, uh, you're, you're in no man's land where it's impossible to say for certain what some of the poetry meant. But once again, the best you can do after a lot of time in academia is be qualified to debate the issue. So pretending like anything in Jewish poetry is obvious in that someone who disagrees with you is purposely trying to undermine the clear meaning, uh, it's a bit incendiary. It's wrong. I don't think any scholar would take that kind of language seriously. And I was, I was tempted to dismiss Dale's entire argument just on the basis of this. But I, I proceed, and I will give Dale a chance right now to, to defend his language, but I, I will proceed beyond that. But I just want to say, you're, when you're listening to Dale's arguments, he is arguing as if there is not a millennia of academic debate on this that goes to this day in that, you know, all you've got to do is look at the Christian view and it makes perfect sense. And all those people who don't agree with it, you know, the, the Jews and the atheists, they're either stupid or dishonest. That's, that's the only conclusion you come to. And that is the wrong way to uh, approach Isaiah 53 or any of the stuff that we're talking about right now. Oh, okay. Uh, okay. So, yep. Uh, so I did. I did say those things. Uh, here's what I was having in mind. Remember, I had to make this on a quick, off the cuff basis. Um, so, yeah. I, when I say it's it's obvious. First of all, there are obvious things in literature. That's just not true. Um, I'm sorry. There are clear meanings that aren't hard to understand. Sure, there are other things that are hard to understand but when I was saying it's clear I think it's clear I don't care about the Jews today saying it, it's referring to the nation I do think it's clear that it's not talking about the nation and I have scholarship to back me up as well um, so I mean that we both I have think, scholarship I do think, sorry <laughs> we both have scholarship backing us up so that's right. that's an right. issue but, right but uh, I'm giving my honest assessment, and I'm not backing down that I think it's clear that it's not referring to the nation. Even, I don't want to get ahead, but David seems to con concede this himself. He, he would disagree with the Jewish scholars that take the national approach, maybe not as forceful as I would. Um, but, yeah, I, I do think that's clear. And I also think it's clear that Jesus has a f unfalsified claim to have fulfilled this. Um to have fulfilled this messianic text. Uh, and I know David has a, a few objections saying, no, there are falsified elements that we'll get to in a minute. Um, but yeah, so that, that's what I meant. I'm not, uh, I'm not, and I also think it's clear that this uh, suffering servant would die and rise from the dead. So that that's what I mean. Like also that. not obvious. Also not clear. I reject it. I don't think the text says that. And so once again, the fact that you think it's so obvious and clear and easy, it just means that you're wearing theological glasses. You're you're bringing you're bringing theology to a literature fight, uh, and you're not bringing any knowledge of literature. And, and so it, because I can because I see how you're parsing the, the words and you're everything that you're doing is toward a theological end without a without what appears to be. I mean, to, to the extent that you're showing your work, you're not showing any respect for the fact that we're dealing with ancient Jewish poetry. How would how would you do that? Cause I, well, I reference because I well, scholarship. They, so are you saying the scholars I reference don't understand the literature? You know better than that. Well, you do. Well, you apparently think the scholars that I mentioned, uh, you know, are, are stupid too. <laughs> so I think I think that you can. I think that any time you read any kind of ancient poetry with theological glasses. It, things get even more confusing than what they need to be. 
mean, it's already a confusing thing. It's already a near impossible thing to parse perfectly. But okay. once you bring once you bring theology into it, you know what the author is saying almost becomes a secondary issue because the only thing that matters, especially for the Christian who's looking at this as a prophecy, the only thing that matters is how it's fulfilled the way they want it to be fulfilled. You're not looking at it, and I, I would, I'm going to. So we're going to go through Isaiah. <laughs> you may not have planned to. But we're going to go through this, and yeah. I, I want to show you where you're dipping in and out of things like taking taking a passage literally. Well, you would take this piece literally, but not that piece. Uh, you know this, and so here's, in order to make it so, well, so yeah, in order I, to make it apply to Jesus, you got to dip in and out of that uh, with with a fair degree of regu- irregularity that would fail you in a literature course. Uh, we'll see about that, but but because I know what you have in mind from reading it. So, but uh, l- let me let me say this just so to to sort of back you up that. I'm not saying everything in here is going to be clear necessarily. I'm not. I, I just said those specific elements I think are clear um, that I'm using to establish my case. That it's okay, but they're not. They're not clear to thousands of Jewish scholars. So it, it, you know, there's there's clearly room to debate. Even the the position that I take, uh, I acknowledge. And I'm not a humble man. <laughs> yeah, I, I acknowledge with some humility now. that is not clear. Yeah, and, and the position that you, you're you now taking, because I don't want to give it away, but you, you've changed from last week, at least in my understanding, of taking a national interpretation. I think that is clearly ruled out by the text. But okay, the but new I don't, take you're going to take is... Just I, because I, that is not the position I... That is not the clearest view of the position I hold doesn't mean I think it's ruled out. I don't think it's ruled out by the text. I just think that there are things that make even more sense of the text. Okay. Um, okay, so that that's where we would disagree then. Because I think and, that, and let me be that, clear. I don't think that it's speaking of an individual is ruled out by the text. I don't think that any of these theories are ruled out by the text. This is, this is part of the problem. You are looking for something that is 100% ruled out and 100% ruled in no. on, a, on a thing that you can't possibly know. No, I'm not. I'm not looking for that. If you can get it, that's great. But I, I think it's okay. extremely improbable that the national interpretation is correct. I think there's a. I think a better way to say it is to say that you disagree with the national interpretation. I get that. That would put you in line with some scholars who disagree with the national interpretation. Most of them agree with the national interpretation. So you're in a minority view. It doesn't mean that it's wrong. It is a minority view. And if all we're doing is scoring scholars. You lose. Uh, so I'm, I'm not in the minority view there, but um, I'm, I'm talking about. Well, here was the point that I just wanted to say, because it it's frustrating to me because you try to make. Here's what I mean by undermining and all this stuff. It, you're trying to make it seem like all of these are just equal options. No, they're not. Certain ones are better than others to varying degrees. Um, so that that's why I'm saying we got to get into the text, like what you're going to be going to be doing next. Um, I, this is what I'm going to be doing next, and I want to go ahead and get into this because it's going to take a long time. All right, but I, but I, I do want the the listener to understand that I am not suggesting that what I am saying is the obvious truth either. I am interpreting literature. But not all claims are equal. Can can you just admit that? Like not not all, all not all claims about the things are equal. But in a thing that we don't know the answer to, the best we can do is treat the literature as fairly as we can and have a reasonable debate about it. Uh, and that, I, I think that's that's the best I'm trying to do. And I think I think I'm more right than you. But I acknowledge that I I don't have access to Isaiah. And I don't have access uh, to the kind of scholarship that would that would give me the complete oeuvre and, and zeitgeist of the time to fully understand this. And, and you're crazy if you think you do. 
Okay. Yeah, I think you, we've said enough on that. I, I just want to, well, do you, do you want me to reply? Like, yeah, my, my only point is I want you to understand, I want people to understand, get, get into the text and, and look at the scholarship on both sides. And I think you'll see that certain interpretations are, are better very, and in some cases clearly better. Um, but I'm not even saying that with a hundred percent certainty or anything like that, but I think it's extremely pro improbable that this text is talking about a national interpretation. That there are other interpretations that I'm sure David's going to mention where it's less less certain or more debatable. So let's let me let me just uh, get into that interpretation right now so that we quit talking around that. Sure. Um, the uh, so the national interpretation would mean that all of the passages of the 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 suffering servant or the special servant. Um, it's talking about all Jews, all Jews everywhere, and uh, so that's that is the most popular view among Jews, I believe. Now there are there is also a, a group of Jews that I would say is strongly represented that would believe instead of a national interpretation, it's an individual interpretation that this is talking about somebody somewhere along the line that's, that's going to be the representation of all this. But there, there is a third view, and I am representing a third view. Now, between the two, I'm closer to the nationalist view than the individual view. And I, I also want to say, this isn't something that I started believing as an atheist to try to undermine the Christian claims. This is what I believed as a Christian after studying it as a Christian. Uh, so if you're, if, you're, if you're going to try to dismiss my view on the basis of, well, this is just what atheists say to, to dismiss claims, that, that is not true in my case. Um, so the view that I have is that the suffering servant, and it's called, it refers to as more than one thing throughout Isaiah, I can hear, but we'll, we'll just say the suffering servant for shorthand, um, is that it is a, a, a semi-national view, uh, which is to say it's still talking about Jews collectively, but not all Jews everywhere in the world. So you have to remember that Judaism is a national religion. And so when a group of people uh, transgress, the entire nation suffers. Let me, let me just point you to David in his census. Uh, the, the, everybody suffered because of the transgression of one person. This is, this is a very Jewish idea. That said, when uh, a, a small number of Jews are faithful, that faithfulness can also be imputed to the entire nation. So, uh, again, it's a nationalistic religion, not an individual uh, religion. And so the suffering servant, uh, well, I don't think that it is the entire body of all Jews. I believe it is that faithful remnant of Jews within uh, the body of Jews, uh, for instance, that suffer unfairly because they were righteous. Uh, remember, it? They, they, were, they were the righteous remnant. Uh, but because of the sins of the nation as a whole, that remnant had to suffer and bear the burdens of that nation. And they had to uh, be counted among the dead. And we can, we can talk about the Jews poetically as being dead um, as, a, as a race. Uh, not as an individual dies, and, uh, but poetically as a, as a nation that has died and this remnant is buried among the criminals. Well, they're not the criminals. They were innocent, but they're buried among the criminals. Um, you can talk about their, their captivity in Babylon and uh, Assyria and Persia as being um, you know, a grave uh, of wealthy of the wealthy, uh, because these were these were great societies that had swallowed up Judaism. So there are ways to look at these passages, but 
all of the things that seem to be talking about an individual suffering for the sins of uh, the nation can be easily understood as a righteous remnant being faithful in their faithfulness being rewarded in saving uh, the Jewish people. I think that makes more sense of it. I won't try to explain it more than that, but I do want to read through at least some of Isaiah 53 uh, with that in mind. Before I do, I will give uh, Dale again a chance to just run and think. To yep. speak here. So, so okay. here, so now, now I can finally say it. So, yeah, um, so this is another, um, I would say, more valid Jewish interpretation of the text, referring to the righteous remnant within Israel. Um, you know, for example, in the Babylonian captivity, D- Daniel would have been considered a righteous part of the righteous remnant within, even though the nation as a whole is being judged, which includes these righteous individuals. Um, they, this righteous remnant, can atone, can be thought of as atoning in some way for the sins of the nation as a whole. However, um, now one thing just to say, so I, this is because I thought David was going for the national interpretation um, and because of, I, I only had one day to prepare and that sort of thing I I didn't do all the research on the uh, rebutting the righteous remnant that I could have um, so this is all, all I'll say um, based on one thing that I did um, because I know the research there, there is a way to address that but here's one thing that I can do against it so in the first place listen to David's words carefully because the righteous remnant could be composed of even one individual like the Messiah for example so that the righteous remnant could be one it doesn't have to be multiple uh, people just like a just like um, an athlete at the Olympics represents their nation that one person wins the gold medal but it's Israel that wins gold in the newspapers not Usain Bolt or something like that so that, why would we think it's an individual? Here, it's the Hebrew grammar itself, because it does speak of the suffering servant in the plural in other places, referring to either the nation of Israel or righteous grant. That's also mentioned in Isaiah. But here, once we get, once, boom, once you get to Isaiah 49 and beyond, it's always in the singular. It's always referring to an individual. Now, David wants to say, well, it's poetry, you can't tell. No, you can. The, the Hebrew author differentiated. He used the plural versus singular once he gets to 49, and he's doing so deliberately because it, b- before that, from Isaiah 40 to thing, you get sort of a mixed bag with the predominant being the nation of Israel and that sort of thing. But then you start to realize, well, the nation of Israel isn't living up to it. They're the blind servant. Um, and then, boom, you get to Isaiah 49. It's it's an in, it's singular. It's always singular. That that isn't just a haphazard poetry device. There there seems to be methodological reason why he's doing that. Um, yeah, it, it, it's it's based on the specific Hebrew grammatical forms um, being used in the text itself that justifies this individual interpretation as being the the more probable and better understanding of the text. Yeah, so I'm gonna I'm gonna just go ahead and jump in uh, here in. Uh, it reiterates something that I've said many times, not necessarily on this podcast, but any any argument um, that comes down to the specific tense of a uh, foreign dead language, um, your your argument is pretty shaky. Uh, I think there are a number of textual reasons why we. That's just not a good way to base an argument because you're assuming that we have a very accurate rendition of the very specific words and that there's, um, you know, so I don't, I, I used to do this as a Christian quite a bit. Um, yeah. And I, I, I got talked down from doing that pretty quickly uh, once I once I began to study and recognize some of the complexity of the grammar and especially of the text, textual criticism issues well, that he, are at play here. Let, let me let me finish this thought though. It becomes even more ridiculous to make your argument based on that in poetry. It doesn't matter whether it's uh, modern American poetry or ancient Hebrew poetry. Um, 
because in poetry there are good reasons uh, why sometimes you might speak of a group as in, in the singular uh, he or she um, and why you may speak even of a single person in the plural as, as they and them and you cannot make an argument based on well it's talking about more than one person or, or only one person because you see it uses the singular here and the plural there that is not an argument that holds up in literature especially referring to poetry. Okay, so, so let me uh, just come back on those two counters then. So with regards to textual criticism, the preservation issues, that that's an interesting take. I can respect that. But here, here's a problem for you because we do have... I saw with my own eyes when I was in Israel the Dead Sea Scrolls. We have the great Isaiah scroll that has preserved, you know, two, about 200 years, 150 to 200 years or so before Jesus. So this, we have this, the Hebrew grammar in the form that I'm talking about before Jesus came. So I don't even have to know what it said 700 years ago. If you want to say the Isaiah scroll from the second century BC, we, we have that. So some guy, if it's totally different from what was written by Isaiah, fine. Some some prophet was there in 200 BC predicting Jesus then. Um, but this, the second point about poetry, so I've, I've been letting you get away with this, but it, I'm sorry, it, it's not poetry. It's not the same genre as songs. I, I get what you're saying. It's prophetic. It's the prophetic poetry, if you want to call it that, or prof the prophecy genre. Um, but that's different from like poetry in the Psalms or something like that. So when you call it poetry, it's like you're trying to equivocate. Well, it's the exact same as something like Psalms, where anything goes kind of thing. Uh, where well, well you know, you're right. I am equivocating by calling it poetry. What I really mean to call it is cl something closer to apocalyptic language. It's like trying to translate Daniel or Revelation. I think that's even more hopeless. I'm give doing you a favor by calling it poetry. Um, well, I, I, that's not a favor then. I, even if it hurts my case, I want to be truthful to what uh, what it is then. If you, if you think it's uh, it, it's prophetic literature that contains pot, great. That's what it is. We need to interpret it in that in that light. But even still, there there is this deliberate change, right? And, and these aren't the only reasons against the righteous remnant. These are the only things that I can think of on, wait, on wait, the What spot. do you mean by this is a deliberate change? A deliberate change? What are you talking about? I mean, because it's, it's used in the plural up until Isaiah 49. Then all of a sudden it stops. Then it's always in the singular after that. Okay, so yeah, so you're back to the plural singular argument. Uh, so, isn't, look, isn't that what I'm <laughs> yeah, I, I suppose, but I, I think that we've probably spun the wheel on that as far as we can. Let's actually look at the text. Um, I get so tired of biblical arguments on unbelievable and other shows uh, that are arguing over passages and no one ever looks at the passages. Um, so uh, I have taken the liberty to just look at some of them. I won't read the whole thing uh, and I hate reading. <laughs> so um, I hate reading aloud. Please, please don't, don't sound bite me there, folks. <laughs> I, love to read. I, I figured I was doing you a favor by not including Isaiah 40 all the way up through Isaiah 54 in my blog. So I <laughs> yeah, I do consider it a favor. Look, I find I find this stuff pretty pretty dull and un, pretty pretty dry. <laughs> so it's um, this is why I think that most people have never read it. I just I talk about Isaiah 53 because a that's the subject of the podcast today it'd be that's what Christians use is, is a hammer that I think they've never read most of them just never read it so um, that said uh, verse 3 uh, just these are things that everybody's familiar with he was despised and rejected uh, by people one who experienced pain and was uh, acquainted with illness people hid their faces from him he was despised, and we considered him insignificant. Uh, question, does that, does that sound like Jesus? Well, you might say, well, of course it does. You see, he was, he was, he was despised by the crowd who said, crucify him and reject him on the cross. You're talking about five minutes of his life. Uh, at some point, we're all despised and rejected. We all feel despised and rejected. That can, um, 
that can that can mean anyone. Uh, and as far as uh, acquainted with pain and illness, we've all been acquainted with pain and illness. Was Jesus really a, a man who was you, what you would consider sickly? Do you have fibromyalgia? Uh, was he, you know, broken down, beaten down physically in some way where you say he was in constant, constant agony? No, that doesn't sound like Jesus. And as far as being despised, despised and rejected by the people, as Christians tell the gospel story, Jesus was one of the most popular men. He was the Beatles <laughs> throughout his ministry. Uh, was he insignificant? Well, he was a person who was pronounced king of the Jews before he was born. Uh, you know, a special star came and pointed uh, pointed out where he was located. Uh, he shows up in the temple at 12 years old, and he's got everyone's attention, and he's got nothing but crowds. It's half of the time he doesn't even want during his ministry. The public officials are out to kill him. You know, he, he's not insignificant. Uh, so how does this passage really relate to Jesus in a specific way? I don't think it does. Okay, um, so so a couple a couple objections, right? Jesus um, is not he has crowds interested in him, and he was sickly and di- sickly when he died, right? Are those the two objections you're giving? Well, no, I'm I'm saying as a a person who's the way it's the way it's written, one who's acquainted with pain and illness. Um, speaks. It sounds like it's speaking of someone who's. Uh, who's suffering a lot. I'm sick. Or... Right. Okay. That, and that doesn't sound like Jesus. And someone who was considered insignificant, overlooked, um, and, you know, unpopular, that also doesn't sound like Jesus. Okay. Um, so here's where you're wrong, then. So taking the sick uh, part first, that's actually a mistranslation. It doesn't say the Messiah himself would be sick. Uh-huh. It says he, in the Hebrew, according to the Hebrew, he would be, and this is both Jewish and Christian translations, um, major translations. The text says that the servant uh, of the Lord will be a man who is intimately associated with pain, grief, and sickness. Um, a man uh, suffering at the hands of people and crushed by the Lord as a guilt offering on our behalf. Um, so, yeah, th- this is also consistent with major rabbinic interpretations. I know David doesn't like me pointing to that, but I, I think it's important to see what the ancient Jews, that they, they're in agreement with me. Um, so, yeah, it's Jesus was certainly associated with the sick. He healed a heck of a lot of people in the Gospels. So, actually, this does refer to Jesus perfectly. Um, well, sure. It, you could you can certainly read it that way. I don't, I'm not suggesting that you can't read it that way, but you can also read it exactly the way that the uh, New English translation uh, uh, reads it, which is the which is the version that I am quoting uh, right now. Those aren't idiots either. Um, yeah. So I look, I don't, I don't, I'm not, I'm not trying to debate every point. I'm just trying to say that there, there is a reading of this that doesn't look a lot like Jesus. But take away that point, I'm still not sure where, where you get that he was, he was considered insignificant, insignificant by whom. Yep. Uh, so, uh, just to read, so it says he will grow up uh, like a young plant or a tender plant, uh, and like a root out of dry ground. Well, that was Jesus. I mean, grow, growing up, uh, nobody really paid attention to him. Nobody cared. His miraculous birth had subsided. I guess people forgot about it when he went down to Egypt and came back up. Um, the, the fact of the matter is, regardless of that. You know, one incident or something like that recorded in Luke. Yeah, it, nobody paid attention to Jesus when he came how do, out. How do you know that? Because every passage that talks about Jesus from his birth on it has him in the light of significance. So you're well, just assuming that the, that, that the time that the Bible's not no. covering, he was insignificant. No, I'm not assuming that. Actually, it's okay. implied in the Bible itself because... Really? 
for example, yep, guess what? Here's here's my argument. Think about this. When he comes out and starts doing his ministry, um, his own relatives who came out and said, oh, you're crazy. You're nothing. You're not the Messiah. You're, or sorry, yeah, yeah, like you're crazy, you know, talking like this and all this sort of, this sort of thing. It, they re- respond to him in a way as though he was just some ordinary schmuck that's all of a sudden taken leave of his senses and thinks he's... I will thank you not to make my own arguments for week five. Okay. (laughs) Because you're not Um, really helping yourself there. (laughs) uh, Don't uh, worry. I'll cover that. (laughs) Okay. Um, But, yeah, so I... I, let me just say this then. I, I think that this could, whether this uh, screws me over for part five or not, that this does apply to Jesus. Um, That's going to screw you over because it's 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 inconsistent. One minute he's the most famous uh, person, he's the Beatles of his day, but when he needs to fulfill this prophecy, he's insignificant. Uh, this is how prophecy works, folks. Um, but it's, it's talking about how he grew grew up, right? How do you start really? Yeah, verse 2. He grew up before them like a tender plant and like a root out of dry ground. He didn't have an impressive form or majesty that we should look at him. No appearance that we should desire him. Um, and then it goes into he was despised and rejected by men. Well, that, that happened. That doesn't say he was always despised or rejected at every single point always in his life. Always significant. Right. So, in that, so, you know, you can read this prophecy. I'm saying throughout most of the life of Jesus that we can read about this passage does not speak to him at all now granted i will give you that you can interpret the you know pain and illness as being around people who are in pain and illness i suppose that's true that's true of everybody who was a jew so i'm you know that's okay that doesn't that doesn't really cover anything so you, you can say one of the lines in this piece of poetry is neutral and the others uh, seem to be pointing away from Jesus, but let's let's look at some more. Sure. Uh, verse five: uh, He was wounded because of our rebellious deeds, uh, crushed. Of course, I didn't. I didn't really want to go over this too much because um, I, I guess I've started crushed. Uh, crushed because of our sins, he endured punishment. Uh, that made us well because of his wounds we were healed. I just wanted to point out when I uh, put this in the blog that this actually makes uh, sense of the remnant theory. Uh, the remnant theory makes sense of this as well because as I explained, the, the remnant were the righteous people who uh, held up their end of the bargain uh, and suffered quietly uh, because of the sins of everyone else uh, is exactly what restores uh, ignorant, uh, Israel. Now, you can say, well, but that could also mean one person. I don't reject that. But it can also mean the righteous remnant. There's nothing in there that says, oh, this has to be Jesus. Here, or even that it has to be one person. Here's one thing that I, I remember that could counter this, then, the remnant versus an individ, uh, versus Jesus. Um, so he's offered as a guilt offering, is in the text, right? And those offerings have to be flawless lambs, um, interpreted to mean they don't have iniquity or sin or, or sinless. Jesus was that. The righteous remnant wasn't sinless. They they committed sins, even though overall they were good. Um, so that might be a way to rule out the righteous remnant. So I'm not gonna I'm not gonna rebut rebuttals outside of Isaiah 53 today. <laughs> okay, so <All> right. <laughs> Yeah, I, that that takes us a little bit further afield. Okay. Um, uh, verse seven. He was treated harshly and afflicted. That's like I said. That's that's true of ten minutes of Jesus' life. Um, but he did not even open his mouth. That is not true. So even if you take the what I call the ten minutes of ten worst minutes of Jesus' life. Um, he was pretty chatty. Just depends on which gospel you read. Uh, so, like a lamb of the slaughter, uh, slaughter block, uh, like a sheep, silent for shears. This is poetry. So it's a lot of repetition. Sorry, uh, he did not even open his mouth. Poetry, poetry, poetry. Or read poetry, people. Uh, but once again, if you want to read it literally. Um, that's not Jesus. That actually does not describe him. Now, I know that some uh, some of the description, uh, uh, you know, written by the gospel creative writers, 
uh, had him silent during some of the times, but not all. And uh, so it's it's one of those things where you can say, oh, look, it's Jesus because you know, you know, this particular gospel writer says he's silent. But when a gospel writer wants to show Jesus making a strong argument, then he's not silent, and he's he's uh, arguing with Pilate about the nature of truth, uh, and he's. Uh, you know, so anyway, not this is that's not necessarily a description of Jesus during the Passion. Okay, but it, it's not just to be clear. Then it's not falsified that it could be Jesus under your prophetic poetry argument. Then if you're if what you're saying is true, you can't rule. You can't falsify that Jesus fulfills this. Well, no, I no, but I, this is where I would say this is Dale dipping in and out of his literal reading of this passage. Uh, okay. If you if you want to if you want to be consistent, Jesus doesn't match that description. But if you want to be more literally correct, then yes, I, you could probably say it doesn't rule him out. But okay, what Jesus so wasn't is okay. he wasn't silent during his passion. Okay, I was just going to avoid. Okay, fine. Then I'll I'll defend it literally because again, you you don't understand the Hebrew text. It's saying, look, he would be led like a lamb to the slaughter and not resist arrest, which is what Jesus did. This is what uh, the Hebrew text means to say in this sense. It's in the you know, so him quoting Psalm 22 on the cross. Did not open his mouth. Case. Sorry? Did not open his mouth. In his defense is what it's trying to, it's what the Hebrew text in this passage is getting at. This is from Hebrew scholars. Okay. He's not going to raise or resist, raise his voice in resistance to the, the charges brought against him. Jesus did that. It's not we'll, saying. We'll talk a little bit in week five about that. But I, uh, in week five, I also might mention that just before uh, that scene in the, uh, where he's captured, he tells his disciples to bring swords. Okay, so he was violent. Okay, yep, I mean, I just a th just a thing. I'm, I'm, um, you know, when Peter chops off the ear of the soldier, that wasn't just Peter being uh, impulsive. Jesus told him, "Bring the sword and be ready." So uh, that's in your Bible, <laughs> so yep, your gospel I, story. I, uh, so, well. um, it, you know, it, just just saying. There are there are a number of ways that you can read it. You can you can kind of poeticize some of it and say, well, you know, you're taking that too literally. Uh, this this has to be Jesus. It, but then when you literalize some of it, then suddenly it's not Jesus. So uh, are, are we going to read this consistently? Uh, if we okay. when when did Jesus uh, order violence? Ordering them to have swords for their self defense is not a violent. Uh, usually Jews point to the temple, like uh, you know Jesus was violent with the temple people and that sort of thing. But Jesus, in that very text that you're raising, Jesus scolds Peter for doing that and says, yeah. "Those by the sword will die by the sword." So we'll talk, we'll talk about it in week, uh, that in week five a little bit. But I just I just want to throw it out there. I mean, because you say that Jesus never said anything or did anything in his defense, and we'll come back to that. Um, but as just didn't do violence then here because it's, it's appropriate here in Isaiah 53 as a counter uh, to you that. Like I get that you want to wait till part five to discuss that. That's fine, but there is a counter uh, to this and notion that Jesus was violent or something. Yeah, that's counter, not true. counter me in part five. Uh, but 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 what you can counter me on here is that he wasn't silent in the passion, and that there were times when he did speak up. Yeah, um, but that's not a violation. I would say. It's okay, but, right. So interpret you can you can interpret that those times when he did not keep his mouth shut is not a violation, but I would just say that, you know, he didn't keep his mouth shut. <laughs> well, he wasn't quite the lamb led to the slaughter. But, uh, but once again, open for debate. You want to make it clear that this is Jesus, and I'm just trying to show places where, you know, that doesn't necessarily fit. Uh, verse 10, uh, though the Lord delivered... Wait a minute, did, did we just do verse 10? Can I... Crush him severely? No, I think no. Okay, have, but, but can I just okay, go ahead? Just remember my cause, because people will just listen to you and forget. Remember my counter, though. I'm saying Isaiah seven. It, it's in context. I mean, he was before his 
um, accused before the shearers is the or before his accusers, and he would not open his I'm mouth. Giving you all kinds of chance to rebut. Defend. I I don't I don't think it's fair to say people will only just remember what I said. No, no, I mean because you because we covered that and gave both sides, but then you brought it up again about the open mouth. So I just wanted to remember so, there's that counter. I'm sorry, you're not going to have the last word every time. If that's what you're. But you're 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 being given ample opportunity to make your case. <laughs> so I am I am I am just making mine. <laughs> So okay, whatever. You give me a chance. Point, give me a chance to make my case. Okay. <laughs> I, mean, I didn't think go ahead. Okay. I mean First because half. even as I'm making my case, I am stopping to let you uh, rebut it. So I think I'm being very fair I, as far as the discussion it. goes. Okay. I don't I don't get why you take it this way. I was I was just saying, look, I you gave your case, then I gave that counter or whatever, then you said it again. Ten minutes later, so I wanted to just remember, remind guys. But remember, I, I had something to say there as well. I'm not trying to be. I'm not saying you're being unfair or something like that. I think well, okay. if, if your counter was so weak that people would forget it ten minutes, uh, <laughs> ten minutes, like maybe you should try a different counter. Um, <laughs> Whatever. Yeah. Go okay. ahead. Move on. <laughs> okay. Verse uh, so though, though the Lord uh, desired to crush. Uh, him and make him ill uh, once I'm sorry uh, once restitution is made he will see uh, descendants enjoy long life and the Lord's purpose will be accomplished through him. This is uh, another one of those passages that doesn't seem to quite fit with the Jesus motif Um, and in particular the, the pieces that I'm looking at. Uh, once restitution is made, he will see his descendants and enjoy a long life. This is the thing that you would say about a mortal human that lives longer than average. This is not a thing that you would say about an immoral an immoral being that never dies. Okay, uh, so that's not true. It doesn't say physical, it doesn't say descendants. The Hebrew expression is see seed. This is the only time in all of the Tanakh, all of the Old Testament, that this specific phrase is used. So right there, you can't be dogmatic as to what it's uh, what it's saying. It's, it's not the case that it's necessarily talking about uh, physical offspring. It could very well be talking about metaphorical uh, brothers and sisters or offerings, sons, son, fellow sons of God, which Christians are said to be. Um, so yeah, I would just say see uh, see his seed. Um, this is a unique phrase, and I don't. This is where there could be a gray zone as to what it's talking about. Uh, I don't think it's clear whether it's referring to physical or meta- metaphorical. We just we just don't know because this is the only time this particular phrase in the Hebrew is ever used in the entire Bible. Yeah, I haven't encountered any Jewish scholarship that um, saw this anything other than descendants. But you know, that's not to say that there aren't. You can find Jews, um, you know, saying all kinds of things. But I, it seems that's like the, the bulk of the scholarship is descendants, no matter how rare this particular formation uh, of that happens to be. Uh, and in that view, Jesus didn't have any. And as far as enjoying a long life, once again, this is a type of thing that is awkward when talking about an immortal being. This is a long life only makes sense for someone who would otherwise, uh, who's, who's going to die. I'm sorry. So a long life only makes sense for someone who's going to die, right? A a long life. If you can say, uh, oh, that person was particularly long lived. Uh, George Herbert Walker Bush died uh, today or yesterday or the news today. Um, he had a long life. He was uh, 94 years old, um, and so one can say he enjoyed a long life. Uh, you wouldn't say that uh, necessarily of a of a person who was incapable of dying. I mean, it would be true that they had a long life because they're incapable of dying, but that that would be an awkward uh, phrase that that 
that would be confusing there. If, you, if what you're referring to is someone who's living forever, there are easier ways to say, even in poetry, that this is someone who's living forever. Yep. Okay, so I get what you're saying. So, first of all, Jesus did die. Obviously, the text speaks of him dying. But then resurrection is prophesied because his days are going to be prolonged after that. Um, so... Yeah, it, it does seem to make sense in prophetic uh, prophetic poetry languages, as David likes to call it. But uh, yeah, it, it makes sense. He, he did have a end to his life, but then they're prolonged after that. With it, how how could that come about? This is where the resurrection uh, part comes in. But is he gonna um, is he gonna die again? No, but then you wouldn't you wouldn't say it was a long life. Uh, that's that's that kind of phraseology suggests a mortal life. I would also argue that this is not talking about resurrection. I know that you see resurrection all through here, but what uh, what I see uh, when it's when it's talking about uh, the dying and then uh, returning is the death of the nation of Israel. And the rebirth of Israel. Uh, that's that's not a human death and then a human resurrection. Uh, so in in many ways, uh, we can say that an organization died, but then it came back. Uh, we can say that about sports teams. We can say that about any number of things. We use this language metaphorically all the time. We're not talking about, you know, some something literally dying, decaying, and then getting resuscitated. Uh, that's a particularly Christian view, and uh, I don't, I don't know that that fits very well here. I'm going to stop short of saying it doesn't fit at all, but it doesn't seem to be the most natural reading. Okay, so so David is uh, correct in that he's uh, look it it can be used in prophetic language. It's it, even even in context of Isaiah, it's talking about the nation of Israel dies through the Babylonian exile uh, and then is restored, uh, you know, to life in the, in terms of the metaphor. Um, but the Messiah here at this point, it's focusing down onto the Messiah, and I'm not going to recap the same arguments. Uh, we've already addressed that. That was the first thing we addressed that the national interpretation doesn't make sense, but. Here's one point I didn't say. So if it is the nation of Israel here, the nation of Israel is referred to as the blind servant. It's not fulfilling this. And it's not the case that Israel was restored. I mean, just read Isaiah 54, up to Isaiah 54. It's clear the nation of Israel hasn't, never did this. It was destroyed. It was conquered again by successive foreign invaders. So they, it's like, if what David saying is true would be he died rose again died then rose again died then rose again multiple times right and it's still hasn't risen to this day after the ancient romans destroyed it okay but under the late fulfillment theory that uh, you're proposing last week and will continue to propose these things haven't happened under jesus either you're just waiting for a later time for the complete fulfillment <laughs> Yeah, but the things that I've said have already come to pass. It's already happened that the nation of Israel has died, rose again, died, rose again, died, rose again. And it's already, it's already true that the righteous remnant has done their work, but maybe the, the complete restoration of Israel hasn't taken place yet. So it, it, I, I, don't, I don't see what your objection is. Okay, so you're saying that it's died and it's in the process of rising again. Sure. It, it hasn't. It, it's a it's a future fulfillment. If, if you want to if you want to use future fulfillment, because you you require future fulfillment to fit Jesus in here too, as we discussed last week. Jeremiah 31 hasn't happened. Yeah, um, I do, but it just doesn't make sense in terms of the nation of Israel because it has had its full. Restoration. How do you know? And it's died again. Well, That's how do you know it's had its full restoration? It's had some uh, aspects of restoration. And, you know, one, one step forward, two steps back, two steps forward, one step back. That doesn't mean that it's uh, had the final fulfillment. 
I think the Jew, the ancient Jews did. That's why they call Cyrus the Great. He's the only pagan in human history to be called Mashiach, the Anointed One, or Messiah, as we translate it. They, they saw, they were restored. The nation was restored in their in their eyes. Um, so okay, they would have said I, I am giving that. you an option of looking at this passage the same way you look at the Jesus fulfillment, in saying that there's a partial fulfillment. And we're waiting on the rest. And you can that can easily be applied to this as well. I'm not saying it's the way it, it is. I don't understand this prophecy completely. I, I can only get bits and pieces of it, but that's a possibility. You cannot yeah. say that that's not a possibility. Yeah. No. Okay. So, yeah, I'm thinking about it because Jew, Jews would say what you're saying. Actually, they they don't believe that. They do true. say what I'm saying. They believe yeah. that the, uh, the mess, well, Messiah, the fulfillment of this thing, is in the future. Okay. Uh, well, it, it's it's the same. It's partially fulfilled and coming to full fulfillment, coming to completion, which is what fulfillment means, right? right. Um, but they, okay, would, they would also say it's also begun, right? And so they yeah, would they would yeah. they would look which at this and say, yeah, it's fulfilled. Not in Jesus. The righteous the righteous remnant did their job, and the ultimate fulfillment will come. I, yeah, I don't um, see what your objection to that is. I'm not. I, I'm okay. After thinking about it, I'm giving it to you. But I would just say. We have other reasons, some of which I've provided here in the podcast, as to why it's not referring to a nation, but to an individual. Uh, so if, if I think that we have agreed earlier that individual... We, so I, I don't think it's referring to an individual, but we I do yeah. agree with you that righteous remnant could be as little as one. And also it could be as many as a thousand. So, I mean, it could be, it could be more than that. It's an indeterminate number. Um, okay. So yeah. I'm not, I'm not eliminating Jesus with that particular objection. I am just eliminating Jesus as the only possibility. Uh, yeah, I would, I would say, I would just say that the individual reading is is the better one. I've tried to argue for that. You guys can decide, but check out the sources that uh, both me and David give in our blogs because you'll get a more fully fleshed out from actual scholars um, to do that. In case you think my case or David's case wasn't convincing, so and, and yeah. I did. I did look into Dale's sources, and I did provide a different source from there. Dale has some skeptical sources that. That are worth looking at, um, but I, I provided uh, one. It's easy to find sources. You can dig up your own sources. Just Google it. There are more sources that you will accidentally run into that that say what I'm suggesting than that say what Dale is suggesting. But I, I definitely look at the sources. Yeah, yeah, and, and decide for yourself. So I'm happy. Okay. Um, any. So let's move on to. The, is there anything Having, else? No. Let's let's go uh, eleven. Having suffered, uh, he will reflect on his work. Uh, I just wanted to highlight here. In in what way does Jesus reflect on his work? That doesn't sound. Once again, it's not saying that couldn't be a, a Jesus figure, but that doesn't sound right. Uh, God God did a thing, and now he's reflecting on it. Uh, and he will be satisfied when he understands what he has done. Again, that doesn't sound like God language. That sounds like human language. Yeah, well, that, that I don't see any problem with doing that. First of all, the Old Testament does do that all the time, right? I mean, it talks about God repenting. It talks about God uh, having arms, <laughs> having eyes, and stuff like that. Uh, but he's he's going to reflect is, on what happened, and once he understands it, you know, once he gets his mind wrapped around it, then, you know, so that's that's not... The language that we would expect. That's all I'm saying. Now, I, I think I started that statement by saying it doesn't eliminate Jesus, but it doesn't make Jesus doesn't make the most sense of it. I think it. I think it could. Um, but just, just okay. I'll, I'll just respond this way. Actually, I, even in, even in the divine nature, I think it makes sense. I don't see anything problematic about him reflecting on what he's done in his in my in the translation I have. I don't know which translation you got. But there's differences in the translations, right? New English translation. Sorry, New English translation. In case anyone wants to know, but look, you can go to BibleGateway.com and read any translation you want. 
Yep, I'm, I'm in the HCSB, so for the Holman's uh, Christian Standard Bible. Um, but uh, yeah, he'll be satisfied um, with his knowledge out of his anguish. Um, but yeah, don't forget, Jesus is fully human, and I have. Uh, I've studied the incarnation and how it would work. So even if it's saying what David's wanting it to say, you know, as though he's, he doesn't have, the Bible itself says that God, the son doesn't have all knowledge in his human, um, human nature. Um, so I think his omniscient, divine omniscience is subconscious. And I'm at a future date, I'm, I'm going to be getting into the coherence of theism um, as a series. And part of that is going to be the coherence of the Trinity and the coherence of the incarnation itself. Um, but yeah, I, uh, there's nothing problematic either way with verse 11 to my mind. So yeah, I guess we'll let people people decide there. And I know there's an objection in 12. I don't know if you're going to raise it, but uh, yeah, so uh, twelve. Just to read it, uh, quickly, so I will assign him uh, a portion with the multitudes. I asked, was was Jesus actually assigned a portion with the multitudes? What does that even mean? Uh, he will decide to uh, divide the spoils uh, of victory with the powerful. That that doesn't sound right either. Um, but I will I will let you uh, raise anything out of twelve you want uh, because that is that is mostly my case of going through this and saying look there's some there's some things that you can say uh, sound like Jesus but there's an awful lot in here that sounds like either not Jesus or where Jesus doesn't fit as well as a different interpretation. So, yeah, uh, yeah. So, um, verse twelve. In terms of that, obviously, he did get mighty as a spoil, right? Because there are Christian kings that bow down to him and submit themselves to to Jesus all the time. So he he was assigned a portion to the mighty. Obviously, that that took time, but it, it's not even. I'm not even having to say, well, it's going to happen in the future. It's already happened. It just didn't happen right away, but. Yeah, this this is true. The kings bow down to Jesus. He's the King of Kings, uh, and that sort of thing. So uh, that's that's the Christian interpretation of that verse and how that would apply to Jesus. Um, but yeah, I, I would agree that uh, look, despite how you know the David's first complaint that you know I was saying, oh, it's obvious, it's clear, and that sort of thing. Um, when I said that, I, I wasn't meaning everything in here. There there are interpretations. Uh, some interpretational gray zones where some things are are, are more iffy than others, um, but there are certain things that are clear, in my opinion. Uh, I, and I've studied both sides and done my best to come to what I think is true. And I, I really do think that it's true that the servant is referring to an individual, uh, and the clearest aspect is that it's not the nation of Israel. I, I don't interpretation is possible but it's not it's not persuasive it's, it's very improbable very very improbable to my mind um, it's it's also people agree with me in their readings um, secondly that this Messiah be cut off cut off from the land of the living would die um, because of the people's rebellions to uh, result in the forgiveness of their sins that their iniquities <laughs> And that that servant would rise from the dead. That's the minimal case. Um, I'm trying to get out of that. I'm not even going into the grave with the wicked or buried buried with the rich at their death. Or that. That's my minimal case, and I think that's a good little nugget. Um, and I don't think any of the reasons David's given to falsify why it can't be Jesus uh, are conclusive on a balance of probabilities. So you can't eliminate Jesus or falsify. Okay, so I don't. I don't think that I. Said it couldn't be Jesus. I, you know, I've been trying to be pretty careful with my language here, and if I've gotten that sloppy, uh, let me see if I can correct some of it. Um, I could have misheard you. I, I, I am. I am making the case that it is. It is not likely Jesus. It doesn't seem like Jesus to me. But uh, then, you know, it could certainly be a Jesus figure that it's talking about. I think I said last week, I'm not even married to the uh, idea of plural here. It could be a singular person. Uh, it, 
it doesn't change um, much of what I've had to say. I just happen to believe this is talking about a righteous remnant within the Jewish people. So in a sense, it is talking about the nation. Uh, it's just talking about one aspect of the nation as it affects the whole. Uh, so and I, just to I back up, just to back up, David, uh, quickly here. It, when I'm talking about, oh, David's trying to falsify. David doesn't have to do that um, to a 100 oh, with 100 percent certainty. No, it, as long as if with one of the elements that David has brought up here, you think on a balance of probabilities, um, falsifies Jesus as a candidate. So it's improbable that he's a candidate. Then that's good enough to be used as as negative evidence against my argument my circumstantial argument so uh, which is which is all I am presenting here yeah, uh, so, I am I am presenting I am poking holes in the quote unquote slam dunk argument that this is Jesus when did I say slam dunk I'm not Alan well, <laughs> <laughs> so um, yeah so Okay, cool. Uh, I will. I will have more to say in week five because that is the time I've been given to make a a an even fuller case. Um, but I I think uh, a you don't have to perfectly understand Isaiah fifty three because no one does. Uh, but B, it, using the kind of Molinistic, uh, almost Molinistic um, response that uh, Dale tends to use a lot, all I need to do is give you one viable alternative. Um, and so, yeah. uh, you know, I don't, I don't actually have to make the case that it means a particular thing. All I have to do is present an argument that it could reasonably mean something else. Um, so I have been doing that, but I'm also not doing it disingenuously. Uh, I've, I've read a lot of scholarship. I read for hours before we went on air today. I've studied this throughout the course of my life. Uh, and the balance of scholarship on this subject seems to agree more with me than Dale. Now, granted, the balance of Christian scholarship does not agree with me, uh, but Christians have a very particular reason for why they want to read it a certain way. Uh, and when you take that reason out of it and just let Isaiah speak for himself, uh, you don't you don't come particularly close to the uh, Christian interpretation of it. And so, once again, though, whether you think you come close or not, or whether you think, yeah, actually, there could be something else. If you if you just land there, I still win this round. And, and that's all I'm doing is winning this round and moving on to the next one. I also I also I'm said last read, week, read, read it for yourself because I think I've won. Uh, it's great. Right. So they, they have the podcast to listen to. I've got a right to say that I think I won this round. So yeah. Yeah, um, not the same. Read, read and decide for yourselves. Uh, kind so of right. here's so right. Here's the thing. I've um, I said. Kind of repeatedly through this. I did. Look, last week I, I, we had this brief discussion. I wanted to skip Isaiah fifty three. Mm -hmm. I think it's a. I think it's a non event. I think it's uh, a waste of time for the most part. And having done the podcast, I think it's a non event, <laughs> largely a waste of time. And one of the reasons that I think so, even after having the discussion is because like all prophecy you can interpret these things in a multiplicity of ways and there's no way for any participant in the discussion to say with 100 percent certainty that their view is the right one i can't even say that uh because i understand a little bit about prophetic language i understand a little bit about literature i understand a little bit about poetry i know enough about poetry to know that we don't have a chance we don't, we didn't, Dale and I, neither one of us is holding the academic credentials to even uh, earn the right to be in this debate. Um, so at the end of the day, uh, yeah, we've, we've both made some interesting arguments that we've gleaned from other people making interesting arguments, but you end up with no more certain knowledge about this than you had before we started. Okay, cool. I'll let you have the, the last word because I initiated. So, yeah, uh, hope you guys enjoy the show. Yeah, and uh, to remind, uh, remind us of what next week is. 
Okay, so... You're, so you're going to talk about timing? Uh, timing of uh, well, well, next week is supposed to be um, my words round two with Alan. That's what we've got agreed, but... Oh, well, uh, with the next, the next messianic round, round is what I mean. Yeah, the next- so I'm, I'm going to be prepared to do the next messianic yeah, I think just in case, you know, he postpones or something, we'll have something ready to go. So that's going to be my grand finale, basically. It's, I'm going to be talking about the timing of the Messiah and that uh, the Messiah had to come and at the very least fulfill partially some of these prophecies. Um before the destruction of the second temple. Uh, so this puts a time stamp message candidates that to which Dave could allude to. And do, do you want to know which Bible verses or No. I don't okay. Know. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what we up. I am fancy. Yeah. Um, um, we, uh, I, w- I want to apologize for some audio glitches that I was not able to edit out of this. I will go ahead and say this right now. Uh, Dale had some uh, bad connection uh, this week, and some of it, uh, some of it, I, I couldn't fix. And so I might have to. You might see that I've interrupted um, once or twice and just kind of summarized what Dale was saying that didn't come through. Uh, hopefully that doesn't happen too much and we'll try to fix it um, next time. So uh, just a just a production note there and uh, thanks everyone and we'll talk to you later. Bye-bye.